BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Just a quick reminder, the Behind the Goals podcast is available every Tuesday with me, Rachel Corsi, and me, Leanne Crichton. It's your one-stop shop for our take on everything that's happening in the world of football. Just head to BBC Sounds or wherever you get your podcasts and search for Behind the Goals. The Scottish Football Podcast. From BBC Radio Scotland. Hello and welcome to the Scottish Football Podcast from BBC Sports Scotland. Today with me, Jonathan Sutherland. Lots to get through as we look ahead to the resumption of domestic football. I feel we've kicked the backside out of our success on the international stage. It's been fantastic, but time to move on. And there's much goodness to be had in the days to come. Uh, Remember, by the way, you can subscribe to this podcast via BBC Sounds and the BBC Sport Scotland website. It is life-enhancing if you like Scottish football, which I am sure you do. Now, we are looking ahead to the Premiership weekend mainly and three matches in particular because of our special guest today, Lee McCulloch. Lee Jig McCulloch. Uh, Lee, welcome to the show, <laughs> Lee McCulloch. Uh, mouth-watering Premiership weekend in prospect and we're going to be focusing on three clubs that you are heavily associated with and the fixtures that they're involved in. So it will be Rangers versus Hibs, Livingston versus Kilmarnock and St Johnston versus Motherwell. Fond memories of all those three clubs, obviously Motherwell, Kilmarnock and Rangers. Yes, I think um, Motherwell was the, the club that sort of got me on my way, the old YTS programme. So it sort of put me on, gave me the confidence under Billy Davis, Alex McLeish, all these managers to really believe that maybe I could go and have a career in it. So, yes, very thankful for Motherwell's a club. It's quite a family club. And then I'm down to England, come back up to Rangers, where probably the highlights of my career, Champions League, and uh, enabled me to get picked regularly for my country. And then moving on after playing Kilmarnock, interim manager, then manager. So, yes, all different parts of the game. Three clubs, three tremendous clubs and yeah, no regrets with any single one of them. All part of the Lee McCulloch story. Let's talk about these weekend games, Lee, shall we? And let's kick off with Rangers versus Hibs. Uh, Big week for Rangers, obviously. With the appointment of their new manager, Philippe Clement, he finds himself in charge of a team seven points behind Celtic. First of all, obviously he did his first media conference this week. Uh, We've heard from the man himself about his ideas and what he wants to do. Uh, What's your take on it, Lee? Well, I think it's um, exciting. A new manager comes in. I think there had to be a new manager come in. I think they've done it at the right time before some big games coming up. It gives uh, Philippe Clement some time to stamp his authority to at least have a go in the league, in the domestic campaign. Um, they've got a massive game in the Cup in, what is it, three, two or three weeks, uh, semi-final against Hearts. That is an absolute must win. They must progress and get through to the final. So I think the board have realised it wasn't quite working the players were playing with not full confidence. And is coming a man now where he's got a proven record of winning leagues. He set his stall out pretty early that he's not going to accept any leniency in the dressing room in um, regards to discipline. Uh, and I think that could be a good thing. I think going forward, results will dictate. We all know that. Results will dictate. But I think the early signs have, have looked good. He's spoke about his philosophy, about the four pillars of success that's going to be at Rangers, which is technical, tactical, physical and mental, which is quite a common thing throughout the world of football. If you're a coach, assistant or a a manager, they're looking at the technical side of it, the tactical side of it, the the physical side of it. Obviously, are you strong enough? And that's mainly usually, in my experience, for the younger ones coming through to get into the first team. So does this tell you that he's looking to promote youth? We've seen there in the the turbulence of the the manager leaving and Stephen Davis and Stevie Smith taking over interim, that there was kids put in there and they'd done really well and the fans took to that. So it brought the fans back to a bit of engagement when you bring in a young player. So just when I'm reading these four pillars that that he's mentioned, does that run towards the the youth set-up to be integrated into the first team? Obviously, I didn't mention the last pillar that, that he mentioned is the mental aspect of it, which vitally important playing uh, like a big club like Rangers, as, as you all know. Absolutely. And obviously a big test straight away. 
against uh, Hibs, who are undefeated under Nick Montgomery. Um, interesting stat I was going to just hit everybody with here at this moment. Lee, the last permanent Rangers boss to lose their first top flight game with the club was... Dick Advocat in August 1998, 25 years ago, over 25 years ago, it was a 2 1 defeat versus Hearts at Tynecastle. This match is at Ibrox. Uh, so you imagine Rangers will still be favourites, obviously, to get the win, Lee. Um, what sort of changes do you want to see from the Rangers playing style in Clement's first game in charge? It'll be hugely intriguing in terms of selection, obviously, but what would you want to see more of in terms of? the way Rangers are playing and compared to the way they've started the season, obviously. Um, yeah, just on your first point, I think it's it's a blessing that Rangers are at home. I think that that gives a big advantage with a new manager coming in. The stadium will be full. It should be bouncing. There'll be a bit of excitement to see how the team play. Very difficult game, though. Um, I'm sure if you had the chance to pick from a Rangers perspective, you wouldn't be picking Hibs at home. You'd be picking somebody else. As you say, they're unbeaten. Nick Montgomery's got them very well disciplined. He's got the mentality completely changed around, swung around full circle from the previous manager that was there. But touching on your point about Rangers, what would I like to see more of? I think from the start of the season, they've lacked playing in the final third. I think they've been concentrating on a lot of possession football across the back and into midfield and back out and playing little patterns. I'd like to see exciting football. I'd like to see the ball forward quickly. And that doesn't mean lumping it forward to centre-forward from centre-half. I think they've got players there that can play through, get the ball wide, get the ball in the box. And it'll be interesting to see what formation he decides to go for, if he's sticking to one formation. Um, The formation was tinkered quite a lot for the domestic to Europe and a couple of previous managers done the same so it'll be interesting to see Philippe Clement sticks to the one formation or he keeps changing it game by game Um, but I would like to see more football in the attacking third and having teams hemmed in and just really really possession based football but in the final third of the pitch How much chance do you give Hibs against Rangers at Ibroxley because as I mentioned undefeated under Nick Montgomery and they'll be looking to spoil the Philippe Clement party there'll be such an expectation from the home fans but obviously Hibs will be looking to get the home fans on the team's back uh, the Rangers team's back which we've seen happen at times this season obviously and with players like Eli Yuan and, and Martin Boyle they're going to possess a real danger at times for Rangers I think so I think Hibs have got a real chance if they can I'm not going to say weather the storm um, but I think Hibs will sit sit deep play an attacking transition and really with the two that you've mentioned Boyle and Johan with the pace they've got they could really cause Rangers problems we've seen Rangers the last year year and a half both full backs are going forward if they can be caught in the counter attack with Boyle and Johan then who knows, but I think the start of the game, you, always when you go to Ibrox as an away team, you try to unsettle the crowd, you, you try to start well and you try to get the crowd on the, the players' backs, as, as you know, but from the Rangers' perspective, it'll be we need to start well, we need to get the crowd with us. So the first 15 minutes, usually 20 minutes of, of the games, go a long way and dictate uh, how it's going to end. So, yes, Boyle and Johan, I, I give. I think it'll be a really, really close game. I think there'll be players still a little bit edgy. I think there'll be players nervous. With a new set of eyes judging them um, on the pitch, I think that that enhances the nerves, so to speak. I think it'll be a really intriguing game and I'm, I'm actually uh, looking forward to it. Yeah, it'll be hugely interesting. Let's move on to the two other games we want to talk about today. Livingston in the top six, away at Kilmarnock, obviously managed by Derek McInnes, who was actually... Lee mentioned by a few pundits as a potential candidate for the Rangers job uh, obviously with victories against Celtic and Rangers already this season do you think he ever really was a realistic candidate? I don't really know I think what happened before maybe has come into play here when Derek knocked to the job back the first time round there's no arguments to whether Derek McInnes is a good manager or not. You look at his track record, you look what he done at Aberdeen, where he started with Aberdeen to where, where he finished with Aberdeen is such a success story. He's got experience, he knows the game. Whether he was a, a realistic candidate, I honestly do not know, but uh, I can see him, yes, that's why his name is in the mix. He's, he started the season really, really well. 
as we know, beating the, beating the old firm. And then they've just struggled a little bit for consistency. Home game, though, they're, they're usually better at home than what they are away from home. But it's a tough test in Livy. The, the two the two plastic pitches are, are playing against each other, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I don't think that's going to whet many people's appetite, to be honest. <laughs> but I think it will be a competitive game, obviously, you'd imagine, with Livy now in the top six. Obviously, they beat Motherwell in their last match. And as you've mentioned, I think... It's right in saying that Kelly haven't won in their last seven, which is, as you say, kind of surprising given how well they started the season. Quick mention of Livingston as well. It looks like Michael Devlin and Christian Montano should be back from injury. And we keep on saying it, season after season, and we talk about managers who've uh, seen sides progress under their tenure. You mentioned Derek McInnes at Aberdeen. Goodness me. Talk about... Um, getting your money's worth out of players. David Martindale, what a manager, what a job. And he continually defies all expectations of people that you know might predict Livingston's demise. As I said, Lee, top six once again. And uh, we keep on saying it's remarkable, but it is remarkable. It needs to be underlined what David Martindale's achieving there. It is. Uh, it's <laughs> punching above their weight for I don't know how many years. Lowest budget probably in the league. He's, they've had problems off the pitch this season with, with the investors and the budget getting cut. Um, and I think they suffered early on at the start of the season, uh, maybe because of these problems, I don't know. But uh, what a turnaround again. A lot of people have tipped at the start of the season Livingston to go down because their budget was getting cut. I actually think they'll be just, in my opinion, just outside the top six again. I think David deserves an enormous amount of credit um, for the way he's took that club up to be challenging for a top six spot most seasons. Um, was it only two seasons ago they, they missed out in the top six with Motherwell from a set plane in the 92nd minute? Or That's right. They're always there or thereabouts, and I think it all comes down to one man, and it's David Martindale's ability as a manager. Absolutely, and Bruce Anderson and Joel Nuble obviously really doing the business on the field for them. So that'll be an interesting one at Rugby Park. Uh, let's now turn to St Johnston versus Motherwell, and quite incredible. St Johnston still winless after eight league games. Uh, in fact, it's their longest winless streak since. Uh, well, depressingly, not that long ago, actually, January 2022, <laughs> when they went 10 games without a win. So they've been here before, and um, that doesn't really give them any sort of silver lining, it has to be said, Lee. It has been a struggle. Do you see green shoots of recovery at McDermott Park? Being brutally honest, no. I don't I, I don't see any ambition for investment in the squad, and, and hopefully I'm wrong with that. I see Stephen McLean, who I know personally, uh, as a good guy, as a good manager. He knows the game, tactical awareness. But sometimes as a manager, you're only as good as the players you've got. That They have had injuries, which hasn't helped. But I just feel for them. I feel for St. Johnson this season. Something's got to happen there. Like no wins in eight. Um, it speaks for itself. Yes, they've been in games. They've been unlucky. Or at times it's been individual mistakes. Uh, which has cost them, but we're coming to the stage now where St. Johnson need to start picking up points, or they could really could be in trouble even before the window opens at Christmas. And I don't even know if there's going to be money made available to bring fresh players in, which, in my opinion, is completely needed. And they're coming up against a team, Motherwell Mall team, with a little bit of a point to prove. Finishing the season so well last season, starting the season so well this season couple of hiccups. I think they went three in the bounce and not winning and Stuart Kettlewell won't like that. Um, but I think there's a realisation amongst the Motherwell fans where since Stuart's come in how well they've done, how well they can play. They've got young Lennon Miller in the middle of the pitch. So there's another one, another graduate player, let's call them, coming through and establishing himself in the first team which is massive for a club like Motherwell. They are undoubtedly a selling club. So the more youth that they can get in to the first team and playing every single week can only be a good thing. And I think the, fa the fans love that, but they want to see success. 
And I know Stuart will be wanting to put points back on the board as quickly as possible. Lennon Miller, of course, sent off in their last match, which was that defeat to Livingston. And you'd imagine that was a contributing factor in Motherwell's demise in that match. Just back to St Johnston for a second, uh, Lee. They have only scored three goals in the Premiership this season, which is quite staggering. And I guess if you're looking for positives, Nicky Clark, Looks like he might be on the way back for them. Somebody who is a proven goal scorer at this level. In fact, maybe somebody that's been slightly underrated at this level. Uh, that's got to be good for St Johnston. Massively, massively underrated at this level. I've I've actually played with Nicky at Rangers. I've played as a striker alongside him. Uh, and I coached him at Dundee United. And Nicky is a, what they call a, a fox in the box. He's movement in and around the box, in and around the final third. Is up there with the best in the league, in my opinion. Uh, really good finisher. So with three goals, no wins in eight, as we're speaking about, I think Nicky Clark could be the guy that if there is a way out of this, I think Nicky Clark could, could be that guy to get uh, a goal, a goal or two, and maybe turnaround mentality round about the, the stands, the stadium and in the dressing room and, and really give it a go. But um, that that's... That's tremendous news for, for St. John's and having Nicky Clark available. Speaking about strikers, and I guess a, a large part of Stuart Kettlewell's philosophy with Motherwell is about you know getting the clean sheet first and foremost, and they'll be wanting to get back to that, but clearly they'll be wanting to score goals. Uh, and Theo Bayer, he might be out to prove a point against his old club St. Johnston. He's at Motherwell, of course. He's only scored one goal this season, and that came uh, in the opening weekend of the Premiership season against Dundee. Um, it would be a great opportunity for him to, to really show his worth to the steel men against his old club. He's a tough shoes to fill with Van Veen leaving. And I think Theo Bear is more of a, a runner type of centre forward. He'll run the channels, he'll get the team up the pitch. He, he's quick, he's strong. I don't see him as a as a out and out goal scorer, natural goal scorer that's going to get 20 plus goals a season like Van Veen, like Nicky Clark, as we've spoke about. I don't think it completely worked out for him at St Johnson. It wasn't playing every week. It was a bit part. So I agree with you. I think he'll be going here with a point to prove. Absolutely. And Lee McCulloch, we have covered all three matches. Uh, looking forward to the weekend overall? Yes, I am. It's good, to, it's good to have the domestic football back. But what a week we've had. Amazing. What a week we've had with, with the Clark as manager, just like the boys, seeing the boys celebrate. Yes, France was, we had, we had our reserves out that night. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. What a good place this country's in, football-wise. To be going to the Euros is something that cannot be underplayed, especially back-to-back. -back. Steve Clark has to go down as one of the best Scottish managers in the squad. We've got a tremendous captain, with strength and depth in the squad. Absolutely delighted for every one of the players and the manager, but of course, the full nation, because I know Germany is going to be an exciting, exciting time uh, for all the Tartan Army. You sound almost as excited as, I think, back in 2007, and you'll remember this well, when we beat Ukraine 3-0 at Hamden, and you were on the score sheet that day, Lee. That was probably the last time, I think, the Tartan Army felt anywhere near as buoyant as they do now. Yeah, that was a special day. I think uh, that was my first international goal and it was a set play and the atmosphere that day was something I will never, ever forget. And to beat Ukraine with the players they had at the time, Shevchenko up front, um, with the players they had at the time, we, we really were flying. But the difference from then to now is then we, we came close. Now, the squad's getting over the line. And that's the big, big difference now. It's not nearly men anymore. It's actually back-to-back -back doing it and, and doing it with pride. You, you, see the boys, you see the boys in the national anthem. Oh, they're all singing it with passion, singing it with pride. And what a way to bring a country together. Game of football. Yeah, I love it. I absolutely <laughs> love it. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm not even embarrassed to see it. Absolutely, yeah. Why not? Quick mention of Friday night in the Championship as well. Our big live match, half past seven on the BBC Scotland channel. Airdrionians versus Queen's Park. And Airdrionians managed by someone that you know quite well, player manager Rhys McCabe. Uh, he's got big ambitions for Airdrionians. 
how highly do you rate him? He's had a great 18 months, promotion under his belt, slap bang in the middle of the championship table, and everything's up for grabs, as we know, in that division. I remember Rhys really well, and I've been in contact with him just before uh, he was the uh, Airdrie manager, and I think he deserves enormous credit. It's difficult enough managing uh, a group of players, but when you're playing and amongst the group of players, it must be even more difficult. And I think I think he potentially will go on to bigger and better things. I just think for, for his self, he needs to keep managing here first and get a, a few games, a good few games under his belt. But Friday night, home game against another sort of form team. They're up. They're always up there. The, what a journey that's been. It's Queen's been Park. great. I mean, they've struggled a little bit in recent weeks, um, yeah. Queen's Park. But yeah, as you say, it's a fantastic story. It is a tremendous story. And uh, they've got some fantastic players like Dom Thomas. He's, he's a phenomenal football player. And, and one that I don't use this often, the last one I probably used it with, with was James McFadden. One that would actually pay to, to go and watch like just natural natural ability when I used to play alongside James he'd do some things and I just burst out laughing on the pitch I'm like how do you do it I'd love to be able to do that <laughs> never mind like think about doing it and and it's just Dom's the same I really hope Reese does well Came back to the original point I really hope Reese does well and goes and proves himself Lee McCulloch it's been an absolute pleasure thank you very much thanks Jonathan thank you and remember a new Scottish football podcast every day on BBC Sounds. The Scottish Football Podcast. From BBC Radio Scotland. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. The Scottish Football Podcast. From BBC Radio Scotland. Hello there and welcome to your latest BBC Sports Scotland Daily Football Podcast with me, Alistair Lamont. You can be sure of never missing an episode by heading to BBC Sounds and subscribing. Domestic football is once more on the agenda after a weird international break in which Scotland were beaten twice and yet it was euphoria all round as Euro 2024 qualification was secured. No one was happier about that than my guest today, none none other than James McFadden. If I did no repeat of the 2007 victory over France, which I know you don't like to discuss anyway, but, but the real negative, actually, from the international break for me was the, the injury to Andy Robertson. We've just heard they'll require surgery. And so, like Kieran Tierney, we'll miss the games against Georgia and Norway. Let's hear, first of all, from his Liverpool manager, Jurgen Klopp. That's a little bit, uh, so I think, the, the decision we go towards um, surgery. Um, there was a little chance that we could try without, but... After talking to pretty much all experts, it looks like uh, surgery will be the best thing for, especially in the long term, definitely. Um, and that means he's out for a while. Don't know exactly how long, but is it shoulder surgery? It's not an easy one. You can train, from my experience, you can train pretty, pretty quickly again, but not football specific because of, you have to be careful. Um, challenges and all these kind of things so um, yeah we'll be out for a while Not great news Faddy then? No it's not I mean you've seen straight away when, when Andy went down he was in a bit of trouble um, and I think that you know when you get an injury you want to avoid surgery as, as much as you can but it sounds like it's it's going to be the best option for Andy I know that Jurgen Klopp said long term but short term as well because it means that he won't have a, a worry about coming back and, and re-injuring it uh, it should be, you know, get it sorted. It's a blow um, for Liverpool. It will be a blow to miss them for the, the games where we're trying to, you know, push for the, uh, the campaign and, and get those two victories that would potentially help us in, in the draw for, for the Euros come the summer. But I think, you know, the main thing is, you know, he gets it sorted uh, and, and Andy's ready to go in the summer. Uh, of course, we'd love to have him for the two games that are coming up. But the most important thing is he's ready for the Euros. Yeah, now we're also joined today by my BBC colleague, Tom English. And Tom, if I can just start by getting your take on France's better use of the ball at the breakdown. Oh, oh wait a minute. Oh, sorry, that's that's the wrong podcast. No, I'm delighted, delighted, delighted Tom is back. Just as well. That's not my fault, that. 
Can I can I can I just confirm? You know, obviously I've been in France for a while covering the World Cup. Under the bar is good, and over the bar is bad. Is that is that right? With this oh, football thing. Spot on. Spot okay, on. I just wanted to make sure I got the right sport here. Delighted you're back to add your wisdom to to the <laughs> discussion. Uh, now, Storm Babbitt is wreaking havoc across the country and uh, a few Saturday's fixtures have already been postponed. Let me just tell you, at time of recording of the games, definitely off. Uh, Aberdeen against Dundee and St. Johnson v Motherwell are both gone from the Premiership card. Our Bros game at home to Wraith Rovers in the Championship is off, as is Cove Rangers against Montrose in League One and the League Two fixtures between Elgin City and Forfar and Stennis Muir v Peterhead. Any further updates uh, will be published at the BBC Sport website. Now, beyond Scotland qualifying then, the big story of the week has been unfolding at Ibrox, and I know Jonathan and Lee McCullough looked ahead to Rangers against Hibs on the previous edition of this podcast, but the new Rangers manager, Philippe Clement, has since held his first pre-match news conference. Let's get a flavour of that. Busy, but <laughs> we expected that one. Uh, it's not been a full week also. So interesting, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a week of making analyze about everything. Um, staff, players to get to know everybody, uh, the way of working, the way I want to implement things. Um, and I've been in a building where everybody was really motivated to do the, to the right things. Of course, it's everywhere the same. It's, it's never perfect from the beginning. That's also impossible. But I see the good intentions uh, in staff, in uh, with the players, and also now the last two days internationals are back, so that's also a difference. Um, and I'm looking forward to tomorrow to to see the first game and to see the little seeds that we planted this week, to see how fast they will grow. I learned a lot, but not for your eyes um, or ears. No, uh, it's important now. I see a lot of good things here, but I see a lot of things that we all together can make better and we need to focus on that now, to do the, the things that, that were not so good before to, to make them better. Um, I hope so. They see differences, but I'm not Harry Potter with the magic stick, um, who can change everything suddenly. Uh, no, it doesn't work that way. So. That's the, the tough balance now coming in during a season. And it's, it's not the first time. It was uh, in Gang the same. It was in Monaco the same. When you come in during a season, you need to make first a good analyze uh, what can be better and what is good also. And then to make a prioritization that you, you look what is the most important things now this week to make better. And then next week, next week, and next week. Because if I try to do everything at one moment, then I kill the players. And you don't have anything anymore. So it needs to be step by step. It's the only way. I'm not, yeah, I'm, I'm somebody calm. I know the way to go, but I want to go fast also. And it depends how fast players react, how, how fast players understand also things. Because it can be that you need to explain some, some things only one time and other things ten times before they understand and they know why to do it and how to do it. Football is a sport of yeah, 10 million or 10 billion small details. I see a lot of details they already possess and they do in a good way. And there are quite some uh, details we, we need to make better. Tom, well, much has happened down Govan Way since you last talked football. What, what do you make of the appointment and what you've heard from the Belgians so far? Um, look, it's interesting. This is a guy, unlike Beal, who's won stuff, who's been around, knows how to win league titles. Um, so that's good. He has that experience of being a winner. Uh, I've read everything uh, he says, and while it's important to read it all, um, I've been around so long now that I don't place much store in talk from all firm managers saying what they're going to do and they're going to do this and they're going to do that. Beal was full of chat about what he was going to do and he didn't do any of it. So the proof of the pudding and all of that. He's talking a good game, come on. Uh, he's talking about playing the ball forward and not thinking about being safe and wanting these players not to be worried about making mistakes. And that's all fine. Not worried about giving the ball away. That's all fine until... The ball is given away at Ibrox and 50,000 people are baying for you. So 
Let's see what happens. He has done it. He's won league titles. It could be a very good appointment, but we don't know. We don't know. You know, we didn't know about Ange Postacoglu. Turned out to be an absolute revelation. Beal came across as a very plausible, but he failed. Let's see how Clement does, and we'll we'll start this weekend. We'll start to start putting the pieces together. But he's got uh, Todd Cantwell and Danilo available to him tomorrow as Rangers injury worries begin to ease slightly. So that's an obvious boost. Is he, is he saying the right things for a Rangers manager so far? Or as Tom is uh, suggesting there, is that kind of irrelevant until we see what happens on the park? I think that, you know, I don't think he's come away with any bold claims about, you know, what he's going to do long term and, and talking about, you know, going in and winning the league and bringing, you know, loads of promises right at the start. I think he spoke about, you know, making changes that have to be made. I mean, I don't think that's outrageous to say that changes have to be made. You know, a manager's lost his job. Of course, changes have to be made. Uh, I think he spoke about, you know, gradually giving the players information um, to, to get his full style across. Um, and I think that, I think he's right. I think that, you know, you can't come in straight away and try to make wholesale changes and, and bombard the players with information because you can only take so much on. I think that, you know, the point forward, it's a, it's an easy one to say because that is obvious that, that Rangers have to play the ball forward quicker. Rangers have to be more of a threat in a, attacking situations, um, and and about bringing you know players believing and, and not worrying about mistakes because there has been a you know a slow a slow play a slow pace to the play. And I think there has been an element of not wanting to take risk and and, and being fearful and making mistakes particularly at Ibrox in front of the crowd uh, because of the, you know, the reaction. So I, I think that, you know, Tom makes great points about, you know, him being a winner. I think even more simple than that is he's been a manager. He's been a manager before. You know, Michael Beale came in off the back of a handful of games as a QPR manager, loads of bold claims, loads, loads of statements, um, and ultimately it failed. I think Philippe, uh, Philippe Clement's come in and, you know, he's he's, back, he's able to back it up by saying, you know, he's, he's getting into jobs previously midway through seasons. He's managed to turn that around or he's managed to go in and do well. I think that, you know, for me, listening to him, I think he said, I think he's been pretty impressive, if I'm being honest, because he hasn't come away and tried to, you know, come away with these massive claims that he's going to do this and that. He spoke about improving the team, improving the belief and getting there step by step. And I think that whether you know Rangers fans want to hear that, they want they want to win and they want to win yesterday. But ultimately he has to fix a broken team because they're low in confidence. They don't look like the, the team that can go and dominate games and blow teams away. So that has to be built up gradually. And so for me I think he's said the right things. I think I think um in recent years uh Rangers uh people have delivered um too much bluster. I think Michael Beale did. I think a number of his players did about having a better squad than Celtic. You know, this, this we routine, r- routinely hear this. And pre Beale as well. Um, Rangers fans or Rangers players bigging themselves up with most no, with, with, with no reason to. It's it's just it's just wind. So I think Clement is probably more grounded than that. As you say, Fadi, I think he's more of a realist. I think he looks tough, he looks quite intense. I think it's gonna be I think it's going to be tough going for these players. He's administration. And I think that's probably what Rangers need. They need to toughen up. He also said something I think was quite interesting. He talked about the training um, and how they train and the length of training and probably ch- and trying to maybe change that that helps reduce the number of injuries. But that is an interesting point. And I know that is a kind of a bugbear with, with bears, if you like. Uh, the number of injuries that Rangers have. It's probably... You know, it's kind of it's just too high. There's too too many injuries at that club. So I, I, the fact that he addressed that, I, I found that quite uh, enlightening. Yeah, well, we shall see the other surviving game uh, on Saturday in the top flight that wasn't examined by Johners and Lee in the previous episode is Ross County at home to St Mirren, who had their wings clipped somewhat in the, that 3-0 defeat by... Rangers just before the break, but Tom, I'm sure their early season form would even have reached the pages of L'Equipe 
which I'm sure you were bruising <laughs> over your morning cafe au lait. Yes, um, I think a page lead uh, three or four days a week, St. Marin in Le Keep, and Midi Olympique and all the other ones. They're, 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 South of France was talked about nothing else. Um, yeah, early season form has has put them in the position they're in. They're not one in, is it three now? But they were away to Hibs, they were away to Killy, and they were home to Rangers. That's that's a kind of tough run, you know. Um, still doing very, very well. Ross County, not one in four, lost the last three, um, not scoring many goals, six. It's... Uh, it looks like St. Mirren back to winning ways for me, uh, this one. Sorry, it's, it's yeah, it's it. Sorry, yeah. Uh, the, the Ross County not winning in the last four at home, that, that strikes me as something that they'll have to remedy pretty quickly, <clears throat> Fadi, if they're to avoid another relegation scrap. Yeah, I think that you know that that's obvious when when you're trying to have whatever your success or whatever your aims and goals are, you have to have good home form. Um, Ross County. Although I think that at times there's been good performances in there, uh, the results are, are all that matter at this time of the season. Uh, St Mirren will be looking to bounce back against Ross County and it's a tough game uh, to, to play in because you know that there will be a reaction. Um, and I know like Stephen Robinson will, will, will say there's, there's factors in it, you know, the red card changes the approach for St Mirren and it changes how they play the game against Rangers. But I think that you know they'll be back and um, back to the best, and that is a huge test for Ross County. They have to get you know back to winning ways. The St Johnson game, being you know caught falling foul of the weather, gives them an, an opportunity to, to extend that gap as well. Um, so yeah, I think that Ross County have to you know find a way to 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 get the victory, um, but it'll be a tough a tough ask against a, a strong St Mirren side. Yeah, well, there'll be updates uh, from that game. Our live commentary is the, the Rangers game tomorrow on Sports Sound, a three o'clock kickoff. Uh, join us for coverage across our digital, online, and radio platforms. But we've saved arguably the best for last Sunday's meeting at Tynecastle between Hearts and Celtic, whose manager Brendan Rogers rather belatedly collected September's Manager of the Month award on Friday. And Matt O'Reilly was rewarded for a fabulous start to the season with the Player of the Month award, difficult to argue with either of those, isn't it, James? Yeah, it's, I think Matt O'Reilly has been outstanding this season. Uh, I think that, you know, he spoke about Adam Gold game and they done that. I think he's became a, a pivotal part in the success um, for Celtic um, and, and Brendan Rodgers, you know. It would have been tough for him at the start of the season. Uh, the pressure that was under to, to get back to, you know, coming back to Celtic, Particularly the, the way he left, but they've really picked up performances over the last number of weeks, um, and it's you, you can't argue with any of those decisions. And you feel that you know an extra an extra week or two of training and, and getting the ideas across, they should they should come back even stronger than than when they finished off. As for Hearts, Tom, but for a crazy couple of minutes in the derby, we'd be sitting here talking about them having won three on the bounce. But do you feel? They have the capability of of really testing Celtic on Sunday. Um, at their very very best, probably, but I don't know. I find it impossible now to to assess this Hearts team because they're up and down, um, and probably more down than up. To be honest with you, uh, you know, cruising against Hibs and the, and and their weakness comes back to haunt them, and they, they only get a draw out of it. They've won, I think, three out of eight in the league and they haven't played Celtic or Rangers yet. And they've scored seven goals, I think it is. Yeah, it's uh, seven goals. Seven goals in eight games. With their supposed firepower, it's not good enough. Like, uh, So I think they're punching below their weight, mm. despite their position in the league. They're going to have to produce something that they haven't produced all season to get a result against the Celtic team, which I, I agree with Fatty. You know, Rodgers and O'Reilly, absolutely deserving winners. But they're, I think Celtic are probably only going to get better because they'll have these defenders coming back in. They'll have, it's got so many options. Um, I, 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 I can't see, unless Hearts deliver their season's best, I can't see them getting anything out of this. 
Well, uh, one piece of good news coming out of Hearts during the week was Craig Gordon being back in full training. Uh, let's hear from his manager, Stephen A. Smith, on that very subject. And now he's at the stage of getting minutes. He just needs to, we need to get games for him to play in and, and, and build their minutes up. And then that gives him a good opportunity as you've got Xander, you've got Shanks. So we've got a few that have been in and around it who will want to do what they can to be in that squad. Craig obviously gets some minutes in a game that we played, um, which is... Uh, the first kind of next step for him which is brilliant so he's now in that zone where he needs to get some minutes to just sharpen up that that last moment that bit but in terms of injury and training he's now consistently training which is brilliant he's one of the experienced group who's had an unbelievable career that that experience that knowledge being on the pitch is good because again some of the boys that have come in haven't trained with him so you get to see his qualities and, and where he's been so that inevitably brings respect from from their guys. It's good for good for him, good for us. This international break and the way it f- turned out for for Scotland, for everybody that's in and around the squad on the fringes of the national team, there's your target. Go and play well for now at the end of the season to get yourself in a, a a Euro or give yourself a chance at getting in the Euro squad. He's an incredible character, Tom. We've spoken at length in the past about his previous recovery from serious injury. But to do it again now in his 40s is remarkable, isn't it? It's it's beyond remarkable. Um, the fact that his body is capable of recovering in that way is one thing. The fact that his mind is still want, you know, is telling him he can still do this. The fact that he has still got the desire to do it. He's got multiple serious injuries, Craig Gordon. And he keeps coming back. I mean, I think he's just the model pro. Like he is just. And forget about football. Forget about you don't have to be a football fan to admire Craig Gordon. The resilience of this man is astonishing. And my admiration for him, being able to do it and wanting to do it at that age, I just think, you know, I take my hat off to him. I think he's a he's a remarkable, a remarkable person and a remarkable player. And, and what Stephen Naismith was referring to, of course, Fadi, was this notion that he could be back to contend for a place in the in the Euro squad, having played with him for Scotland and knowing his mentality, can you see him pushing for a place in that squad? Yeah, I think that, you know, Craig Gordon's shown, as Tom says, great resilience uh, previously. I think that the issues that Craig had when he when he was younger was it probably really difficult in terms that they couldn't find what was wrong with him. So it was almost rehab, come back, there's still an issue or there's a different problem. And it was it seemed to be like an endless cycle of there's something wrong, we don't know how to fix it, we'll try this, and ultimately spent so much time out. I think that Craig's focus would have would have always been there um to get back. And the fact that it was, you know, leg break, horrific double leg break, he would have known that when the bone heals, that's him, he's back. And he wouldn't have to worry about, you know, parts of his knee or whatever else um previously. But Craig's highly motivated to continue playing as long as he can. I'll, every time I see him, I think he, he's retired now, but I used to see him and, and say, that's Buffon still playing until he's 45. You know, that's his, <laughs> that's his hero, that's his idol. And he's like, oh, I know, I wish he would stop. So I'm not saying he's going to play for that long, but he is an inspiration to Craig. And, and as long as he gets back training and playing to the standard that he was showing before his injury, then he can absolutely push his way into the, the Scotland squad because, unfortunately, for Sander Clark, you know, if he gets back to any kind of level, then he's competing for him straight away for, for the number one jersey at Hearts. And if he takes that, then you would expect that he, he will go into the, the squad, uh, the Scotland squad as well. So that's a motivation for Craig. I think the longevity in his career is a motivation, but absolutely to, to get himself involved in those Euros, that would be a massive, you know, carrot for, for Craig to go and chase. I, th- I think he's, you know, what he's doing by coming back from these injuries at his age, it just, I think it reverberates around <clears throat> Scottish football. To any footballer of any kind of age, professional footballer who suffers a calamitous injury, and there's plenty of them out there. And you look at Craig Gordon, you think, okay, he can do it, I can do it. He's, he's not just an example to Hearts players, it's an example to every player. I'm just I'm blown away by this guy constantly. I have been for <laughs> for years. Yeah, well, uh, we wish Craig Gordon all the best in his continued recovery. Of course, that's pretty much all we've got time for today. Faddy and I are off to brave the elements in Airdrie for their game against Queen's Park. 
join us on BBC Scotland from 7.30 on Friday evening, if you're listening prior to that. Tom, I shall see you at Ibrox for Philippe Clément's first game as Rangers manager. Comprehensive coverage of all the weekend action across BBC Scotland. From us, it's bye for now.